we've been talking about the situation in uh, human rights at the moment. Before we proceed with Marcelo to talk about the exhibition, that we have Keiko say, I think you also, uh, many of you may know her, she's a curator, artist, activist dedicated to Myanmar and living here in Thailand. And then we have uh, the youngest uh, of us all, who is going to speak about Patrick uh, Stone? I am not sure about the family name and his it, but he's going to speak. He's an artist from Myanmar, and he's going to speak about youth, art, and democracy. And his friend here will translate letter for him. So I think it will be a very interesting program. We will start immediately with the music. So please, one one. We can start. Yeah. 
eight, you might want to keep that right and left spin this kind of box. That's this right, this and just meant to pick up shift that they are doing. Let me say it's also great to see that the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy and the Asian Democracy Network are supporting an event like this as well. Um, this kind of inspiring awareness raising event is really important here in Thailand. Because once again, Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Mesot, it's, it, it's back to being a frontline state. 
and the people struggle uh, to prevent the military of Myanmar from dragging the country back into the dark ages of dictatorship. And we need more support uh, from the Thai people uh, for this struggle. Uh, without that kind of support, it's very easy for the army to push refugees across the border. It's very easy for Prime Minister Prayut Chan O Cha and Deputy Prime Minister Poet Wong Suan to become close friends by support and moral support in the halls of ASEAN or from Min Online in the Junta. Um, it's, it's really very vital that we have these kind of events that will remind the Thai people that they have more in common with the struggle of the Burmese people than they do uh, the pronunciations of their government. Um, at events like this, you know, I, I find that others, of course, talk about the art. And I'm always the speaker that gets uh, asked to deliver the hard, cold facts about how bad the situation is. Um, and sadly, today uh, will be no exception. Um, as you might expect, I'm going to talk a little bit about the human rights violations, the atrocities committed by the junta, and, but also some important ways to hold them accountable. Um, and, you know, after discussing some of these issues, uh, you know, I'll, I'll raise some views on what the international community is doing or not doing uh, to help restore and uphold respect for human rights in Myanmar. Um, but let me, before I get into those remarks, let me say that um, I'm, I work for the human rights movement. I have to be an optimist. Uh, if I'm not an optimist, what am I doing? Um, and I do believe, actually, that the darkest hour is, is before the dawn. And in these paintings and art, and in the day-to-day -day actions of the Burmese people uh, in the CDM, through boycotts, strikes, organizing, pop-up protests, documenting rights abuses, exposing junta actions, talking to social media, producing art like this, the Burmese people are saying very clearly that they will never ever accept this military regime. They will never ever accept this military coup. And, you know, the sustained actions of the people to resist over the past some 450 days since the February 1st, 2021 coup is really what's happening in Myanmar. That's the story. And, you know, no previous cycle of protest uh, or resistance was sustained like this. If you look at the, at the history really from uh, 1990 onwards, or actually even going back to 1974, um, uh, none of this resulted also in the creation now what we see of an armed wing, uh, which is the People's Defense Forces. Um, you know, I, as a human rights advocate working for an international human rights organization, I can't say that I support the PDF. Um, everybody has to make their own decision on what they're going to do about that. But the creation of those entities is something that is new and different from what happened previously. Uh, it's pretty clear that Senior General Min Aung Lai and the SAC Junta thought this coup was going to be really easy. Uh, they thought that the people would protest a little bit and then ultimately accept their fate. Uh, and that the military could drag the country back into the dark days of military dictatorship. They could, they could hold a selection in 2023. Uh, they could uh, get rid of the NLD. They could get rid of the democracy parties. They could, you know, do the sort of things that Hun Sen has done in Cambodia. Uh, you know, create a single party state backed by the military and the security forces. Um, and it, it is quite clear that like Vladimir Putin, underestimated the resistance of the Ukrainian people, so too did Min Online underestimate the determination of the people, Burmese people, to defend their rights and their democracy. And it's interesting that both Putin and his close friend Min Online both underestimated the willingness of the international to content it that they both uh, underestimated the, the willingness of the international community co to condemn their actions and to respond. And while I would say that we are certainly far from what we need for the Burmese people's struggle, you know, and we look at what has been, been done for Ukraine and the Burmese people say, well, you know, how come we don't have that kind of response? The response, to be honest, has been significantly more than what I ever expected. 
Uh, and I think that we continue to build on that response. That, you know, this is, the response to the international community is not necessarily over uh, when it comes to Burma, but it is continuing. And, and we have to work harder through greater advocacy to expand it. And we will get there where we want to get to. Um, but I will say that international solidarity for Burma is not going to come from ASEAN. And it's time to dump the failed notion of so-called ASEAN centrality in resolving the situation in Myanmar. Uh, this is the thing that countries uh, like Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, all these others say ASEAN centrality, ASEAN centrality, when they don't actually have a solution and they have no way to a solution. And in fact, if you look at ASEAN, ASEAN is probably the least well-equipped international body to deal with an issue like the situation in Burma because they don't uh, interfere in internal affairs of other countries. Uh, they don't, uh, they uphold a veto. I mean, they're basically a, a do-nothing organization. Um, so it's, it's absolutely unacceptable for the likes of uh, Australia or Britain or the European Union, the United States, to say, oh, well, we care a great deal about uh, what's happening in Myanmar, but we believe in ASEAN centrality and push it over to ASEAN to let them solve it. It's like, you know, asking your little brother to take out the trash every day. You know, please go deal with this, okay? Thank you. We're busy with Ukraine, go away. And, and that is unacceptable. Um, it's worth noting that, you know, just on April 24th, two days ago, we marked the first anniversary of the failed ASEAN uh, five-point consensus, which was agreed between uh, Group Commander Senior Devin Lin Ong Lang and, and the ASEAN leaders in the Carta. Nothing has been achieved on any of those five points. Nothing at all. It's, it's, it's really astounding. They really have achieved nothing. Um, and right now what's happening in Myanmar is then a tug of war between the military leaders and their forces versus the people. On one hand, the government has the upper hand and the ability to use violence and inspire terror. And we're seeing that through the nightly raids and arrests that happen every night across Burma and the torture that's happening in military interrogation centers. centers. But the people themselves have their, their economic weapons. They have the mass strike. They have the boycotts, they have the refusal to pay taxes and support the government. And increasingly, they have the ability to strike back uh, violently through the PDFs. And so this tug of war which is going on now will, will take a while. But I honestly believe that time is on the side of the people because what has changed in Myanmar and what is happening in Myanmar is the sustained resistance of the people. And that there will, while there certainly will be a lot more suffering, uh, and there will be tragically many more lives lost, that eventually the people will prevail. And the international community has a very important role to play in supporting the people's cause and hurrying that day of victory uh, when uh, the military steps aside. And ultimately, you know, we may see a new constitution, we may see all sorts of types of reforms. I, mean, I think that's what uh, all of us would hope for. Um, but in the meantime, we also have to look at accountability. And quite clearly, the Myanmar junta has uh, committed crimes against humanity, against the people. Uh, these are systematic and severe abuses, and they're not just happening in one state or state, but they're, and they're not just happening under one military or one command or one police grouping, but they're happening across the country and they're happening systematically. We've seen massacres in Kareni uh, state, we've seen uh, massacres in towns and villages across the dying division in Chin State and elsewhere. And these atrocities reinforce what we've always known, that the Tatmadaw has no hesitation in using deadly force against anyone it encounters when it goes into the field, and that it practices scorched earth tactics against villages and settlements, as Reuters just showed uh, in a, that very good report about what's happening in Sagaing. And then they often kill anyone, unfortunately, to be caught by the troops as they conduct their so-called clearance operations. We've seen indiscriminate use of aerial bombardments uh, in Karen State, Kachin State, um, and elsewhere, bombing churches, schools, hospitals, villages. Uh, and of course, the Myanmar military has returned to the use of rape as a weapon of war. There's no accountability for rank and file soldiers or police committing atrocities nor for their commanders. 
what we've seen is what happened to the Rohingya in 2017 is something that other ethnic minorities couldn't stand because something like that has happened to them too in various places, locales that they are. And now we see uh, the Burmans in the, in the central areas of Burma in the cities also facing the Tabadaw. And it's sort of like a light bulb went off that everybody understood finally what the Tabadaw is really all about. Um, I won't bore you with all the statistics, you know, how many people killed, how many people arrested. It goes up, it goes up, it goes up. You can look at the internet as well. But what is certainly diminishing is the support for the military junta. Foreign investors are heading for the door. Interna international chambers of commerce bemoan the junta's policies. The junta is shooting itself in the foot with the mandatory currency conversion requirements that will make it difficult, if not impossible, for foreign companies to do business in Burma. And it's good news that the MEL and the MEC military conglomerates are under scrutiny and attack like never before. Every day brings a new expose, new pressure for additional sanctions. And no one ever thought companies like Total or Kieran Beer or others would leave their lucrative contracts in Myanmar. So what we need is an expansion of international economic sanctions against military junta orders. And we especially need it from Japan, Australia, India, South Korea, and Thailand, these frontline states, these important states in Asia which have done nothing. And we need to end the game with ASEAN. ASEAN needs to have a clear deadline, maybe two or three months. If you can't do it, get out of the way. And that is the message that Joe Biden should deliver to the ASEAN leaders when they visit him in the White House on May 12th and 13th. So with that, uh, it's a great privilege to be here. I think while it looks dark right now, I think that we're on the winning side. The people of Myanmar will prevail. And you know, you, the spirit you see in these, these art pieces by Marcelo show that. So enjoy the exhibition. Thanks so much. Hello, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being here. It is a pleasure to have the possibility of bring Latin American solidarity to the Burmese resistance. I come from far away. I have a big jet lag with 10 hours of difference with Buenos Aires. But it is a privilege to show the resistance now, as you see in these images. This happened six weeks ago when we were showing these uh, works in Bergen. We met the people from the National Unity Government that are legally represented in Norway, as they are not here. And they presented this uh, video, they gave me this video, which what happened the day before of our opening. You see the flash mob in the streets of Yangon. This is not a year ago, this is now. It is very fast, as soon as there is a word of order, they disperse. But this is the resistance that the people are doing in the streets of the Burmese cities now. And that is combined with the resistance of the PDF. I can easily remember the letters because they are a PDF. So it's something we use a lot, the PDF. So the people defense forces. Uh, I am an artist. I am not. I can say whatever I want. So I support this strike, this fight, both in the streets of Myanmar and in the jungles of Myanmar. Uh, of course, ASEAN will not do anything to support this. But uh, as a Latin American artist, I can and I am free to do that. Because in 1976 we had a coup 
as you had now, 24th of March of 1976, the military took power in Argentina. Many of us were killed, 30,000, among them my own brother and many of my friends. We resisted. We called for international solidarity with human rights organizations all over the world, but basically our own, like mothers and grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo that looked for their missing children or for their missing grandchildren. This was a bloody dictatorship and it lasted seven years. But after all this international solidarity and prosecution of the junta in Italy, France, Spain, and all over the world where we couldn't process the junta internally, of course, because they were in power, but we did all our prosecutions for human rights violations in different parts of the world. And uh, in 1983, the junta uh, had to leave power as a consequence of the resistance and also as a consequence of their defeat in the Malvinas Falklands War. Both came together, but not only this. In 1984, we prosecuted the Junta members and they have been uh, prosecuted for the last 30 to 40 years and they are now in prison. So we never thought when the coup came and our friends were killed, this would be possible. But not only was it possible, but it is happening now. The prosecutions are still ongoing in Argentina 40 years after the coup. So as an artist that suffered this, uh, and as a victim as well, because my brother is one of the victims, and my mother is a mother of Plaza de Mayo, was, she died three years ago, but she used the white handkerchief that identifies our human rights movements. Uh, well, I started to work on art and my first work was about the missing people of my school and my missing brother. That's an artwork I made in 1996 almost 20 years after the coup, when we started remembering the names of the missing in our school, which are 113. The picture I made on that work, which is a picture of my classroom in which the two victims of my class are signaled out and marked, Martin and Claudio, is in the collection and was shown last year in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, in the Tate Gallery in London, the National Museum of Argentina, Colombia, Sao Paulo, Pinacoteca, Houston Museum of Fine Arts, etc. It's an art work. Art and culture can also help these people that are in the streets of Burma and it can also help the resistance of the PDF and the NUG from a cultural perspective. Culture can bring, for instance, the opportunity for this conversation. We just have an exhibition, we come together, there is somebody from a human rights organization from based in New York, we have the young people of Burma in the streets. We have the PDF in the jungle and the pictures in the wall. Everything comes together and it's a honor for me as a Latin American activist and artist to share these images with you. Thank you.
Yeah, hi. Um, hello, my name is Kate Jose. Um, do, do you hear me? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, uh, yes, um, I work as an um, art curator and an uh, act activist. But like uh, I, I teach uh, media activism and creative activism as well. And actually, I I work in uh, Eastern Europe before I moved to Myanmar. I was uh, asked by the Myanmar activists to um, to use my experience in Eastern Europe to work for Myanmar. And then this is how I moved from Eastern Europe to to Myanmar. To Myanmar, I'm mean, actually in Thailand. Live in Thailand and work in Myanmar, and so now I, it's it's a it's it's a very difficult time for me because uh, you know Eastern Europe is my second home now it's a war there in Ukraine and uh, so uh, every day I have to watch um, I have to see terrible terrible uh, news from Ukraine and those my friends are you know facing but they don't. And on the other hand, I have to see, I have to see, but you know, in Myanmar, I didn't think I was saying it's happening. And this is equally terrible, but it's more like attention is going to, it is focused on Ukraine right now. So I have to have this double, you know, um, kind of culture in my mind, and this is, um, uh, this is a very, um, uh, difficult situation, but uh, why? And now I talk about why art helps in this kind of situation, or for people like me, right? Um, so um, we all remember uh, February first, two thousand twenty-one, the terrible day, terrible morning. We all remember. Uh, we were like, so anxious and so, um, and we did, you know, felt a little bit powerless and we didn't know what to do. Like I think this all the Myanmar people and then the people who are, have been involved in Myanmar, we all felt this um, anxiety and then, you know, what's coming, what's, you know, it's maybe the worst, uh, Nightmare maybe coming, and so like couple of, the first couple of days was on the ground level. It, it looked like it was very quiet because people really didn't know what to do. And then uh, after that, we started to hear, you know, banging of pots and pans, right? So that started. So that was kind of the beginning of resistance happened. And uh, so this kind of a creative protest, activism, came from the sound. And also, it was a very traditionally rooted one. It's not something that they, people, they copy from the West or anything, but um, this pot, banging pots and pans, uh, it was a traditional purpose or sign of war action of warding off the bad spirit, right, from your house. So they used that to, you know, start a process. And then on the 4th of February, this image was spread. This image came out from your house. Projection. This is a downtown young So this was the first kind of protest image that we saw from that. I mean, at least you know that the, the people who are living outside Myanmar is concerned. This was the first kind of protest image that uh, uh, was uh, that came out from Myanmar. And uh, this is like a projection of the series of the images. And it turned out, I didn't know at the time, but I have, I felt like so encouraged by that, um, by this action, because this is also kind of like sign of, you know, yeah, let's, you know, we are 
submitting to the military. We put protests. So that was a sign of it. And we felt really encouraged. And we we felt we uh, felt the hope. And actually, this is done by a film person. I cannot name this person because he had to go <laughs> hiding after because of this accident. Um, so he thought, you know, because everybody wanted to do something about the coup. We all, we all feel this. We all, like other citizens or other, you know, um, doctor or other, you know, whatever profession you are. We all want to do something in our capacity. And so as artists, so as filmmakers. And so this person is uh, in, involved in the film. And so he said, I'm a film person. Okay, what I can do is project, <laughs> project the image. So this is what he did. And uh, also, um, because he's not the artist himself, he collected the images from the internet. Because internet is already some people are like, you know, exchanging all those images and so on, protest images and so on. So he corrected all those images in that, you know, last two days before this action. So there is a archival element in this. There is a significance in the archival element in this, uh, in this uh, project. And also he um, shot a video of his action. I cannot show this video to you in this occasion uh, because it's a little bit uh, sensitive. Um, so, but in a video, you there are all the elements in this first protest, the beginning of the protest, like this projection, and the people are watching the projection, and people are banging the pots and pans in the apartment, and also you hear the sound of banging pots and pans. So the all the important element is in the um, video. So he also documented, it's a very important document of that, um, of, of that day, uh, of the beginning. And uh, so this was so inspirational for younger activists. Although he himself uh, had to go under hiding, hiding, and then, you know, his life became so miserable. Like we all had, you know, so how his life was crumbling down because of this action. But the young artist was so inspired by this. So he, um, the young, young people continued. They, they started projecting to many places, like a guerrilla movement. So they projected this and that, that. And then even they managed to project to the uh, Yangon City Hall, which is the most dangerous place to project. Like, um, you know, because of the barbed wire everywhere, and you know, the, the police and military always guarding the protests of the city, the city hall. So some of they also sneak into that place and they projected it. So this was like, you know, um, it was a uh, uh, very important uh, protest action. And, but then why? We feel always hope from those creative actions. It's because we um, feel the resilience of those people, and also we feel the power and the asset and the tool and the weapon that those people have, which is imagination, imagination and creativity, which is completely lack in the military. Military has a zero, zero imagination, zero creativity, right? They only have a weapon, they have only, they're only interested in cursing, 
coercing people to submit. That's the only power they have. And but these people have something that military or authoritarian figures don't have. So with these actions, they present those powers and the tools and the weapons. So that's why that's why we feel um, really hope in those actions. And uh, I show another um, another series of this uh, image. Like for example, uh, this is a, a graffiti image, graffiti that is uh, done by graffiti artists. It's a three fingers, right? It's a three finger. And yeah, they did it. Okay, so next, an authority uh, painted black, they, they erased it. And then the next piece, and then they painted, <laughs> the graffiti artist painted over, yeah, the black. And this is the sign of resilience and the creativity and the imaginations. So that's, uh, in those actions, we really feel hope. And um, and so um, I was very depressed at the very beginning because you know I invested 20 years of my life in uh, you know time and energy and passion to develop the culture in you know art and the film in Myanmar. So I thought that you know my 20 years of life is just gone in one day, in one instance. But when I started to see those resilience, those actions, those protests, um, I thought, okay, you know, my stupid 20 years is nothing. So I would go with them till my rest of my life uh, for those people who keep protesting. And these, these gentlemen, you know, the previous panelists, they um, gave us a hope if from different perspectives, from human rights perspective, from artistic perspective, they gave us a hope. But we can also, you know, feel the hope from all kind of art activities that um, uh, these young people are doing. Okay, so this is my uh, presentation, and then the last, uh, this is just an announcement, but like for example, there is an exhibition going on here. But the, uh, for example, um, in Japan, there uh, my uh, friend of mine, uh, the curator, Japanese curator, she is now launching this uh, uh, exhibition. Uh, it's called Masking and Unmasking. So the art collective called uh, what's, there's a one Myanmar art collective in Japan. They uh, make a mask from the dead people, dead activists. So it is to do with uh, the COVID face mask and uh, the death of Myanmar. This is, uh, it's going to launch in, uh, very soon uh, from Tokyo Mi University of Arts. So, um, you know, the curators are working on uh, showing those artworks museums, art spaces, they are, they, they still uh, keep working on presenting those uh, very inspirational artwork so that we don't uh, forget Myanmar. So that we always, always remember what is happening in Myanmar and uh, don't lose the hope. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Keiko, for this uh, inspiring uh, speech, and it fit very well. We have talked about young people of Myanmar, and now we are going to the young person, an artist of Myanmar. Please, Patrick, and if you need to translate. Hi, everyone. Saurika. Uh, uh, my name is Patrick Song, and I'm a freelance graphic designer and digital artist from Myanmar. 
um, actually I'm not very good in English, so my friend will translate for me. But my own channel, Lunga, the Yapi, the Edward, Lunga, Yet, and Yale, Yopi, and 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 Yopi, ดูเงี้ยเราจะช่วยตัวอัตราที่แบบปีละยาเองเช่นเดียวกันเนาะจะช่วยตรงนี้ตามส่วนที่ส่งส่งเนี่ยอ่าดีตอนนี้ยี่
already, and I feel very afraid that uh, the international communities uh, will forget what is really happening in Myanmar. Um, I very thanks um, to experts. Um, my thanks to all those who are contributing in terms of the um, monetary values or in terms of the voluntary values uh, to Myanmar revolutions and the people of Myanmar. Um, Myanmar is not yet normal as it used to be um, and therefore um, the people of Myanmar still need a lot of help um, and that's why I would like to request to uh, continue giving the help that they need. Now so to know your generality, Myanmar to lay it up on all, um, finally, I would like to um, share with you all on how you can help the people of Myanmar. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is um, I request you to um, have your ongoing awareness about what is happening in Myanmar. The news came uh, inside from the Myanmar. Secondly, we have to continue doing the point court and um, social punishment activities to the military communities and the military related uh, business enterprises. อ๋อตะเนี่ยยินจีเนี่ยชักก็รอคลิกตูโดเนทสรเอาอารมณ์จ้าบุจาหาอ่าไอ้หลาที่เราอินเทอร์เน็ตบอกมาดูแล้วก
have more contact with visual material than with anything else. That's why my work is about language. It's about visual language, how to combine photography with text and color to deliver a message that is easily understandable by the younger generation of viewers. I invite you to photograph and post these images so they can make their work in the Myanmar community and help them get the resources they need to resist this fucking military murderers. And uh, after we saw how they shot hundreds of young people in the streets, and that's how they had to hide and go to the jungle, we understand that they have the right to defend themselves. And all we can do is support them with solidarity, with art, with words, and with action. And I invite you to share that with us. Other uh, question? Anyone also want to comment to the artist or no? Okay, so please. Uh, thank you for that question. I mean, what you're talking about is internally displaced persons, people inside Myanmar who cannot escape across a border to international safety. Um, but I would say to you that actually even the people who are escaping out of Myanmar to Thailand or to India are facing very significant challenges. Um, we know, for instance, that the uh, Thai army is continuing to force refugees back or asylum seekers back. They don't allow them to stay very long on Thai soil. They claim that everything's fine, you have to go back now. I mean, we, I mean, we have cases of people who are sleeping on one side of the river and coming across the river to get food and then going back rather than being allowed to come to safety. Uh, you know, that's outrageous, that's unacceptable, and the Thai authorities should stop that. But for the internally displaced persons, you know, for instance in Sakaing or other parts of the center of, uh, of, of, of Myanmar, uh, or in the cities, people who are hiding, it's, it's a very difficult situation. How are we going to help them? Um, you know, this is where, you know, World Food Program has said that they are providing assistance, uh, emergency feeding. You know, I don't really know how much that is actually reaching these internally displaced persons. Um, what we can do is we can try to pressure uh, the Myanmar military to stop attacks on civilians. That's what's causing these these places. The, the, the fact is that the military believes that a certain village or a certain township has PDF people operating there, so they bomb it, uh, they burn it, and people lose everything. 
uh, they, they flee for their lives, they lose their homes, they lose all their possessions. They're hiding in the jungle. Um, you know, there needs to be a way to stop the, 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 the actions of the Myanmar military attacking civilians. And that's a very difficult thing to do in the sense that we have to document what's happening. We have to figure out who's doing it. And then we have to find a way to hold them accountable. And all those things so far, we have not been successful in doing. But at a minimum, we should be pressing the UN uh, with their new, they have their new guidelines on engagement, uh, which supposedly says that they shouldn't coordinate directly with the Myanmar military junta. Uh, how do they get, for instance, assistance to those people, at least so that they have basic food, medicines, and other necessities provided for? And that's the sort of thing I think that we need to be looking at. Let me just say one thing, uh, one more thing. All our victims in Argentina, the 30,000, were named. They have a name. And we have made a monument 20 years ago with all these names. And the monument keeps their memory. I am involved in the organization of this monument to the victims of state terror. So things change a long time. Don't forget their name. Of course, there is a possibility to offer support through the NUG, the National Unity Government. They are also raising funds and they are also trying to reach through civil society and other groups to this internally displaced uh, people. The second is there is also another kind of internally displaced people now who are the one running out from the PDF. So, and those people are probably what the government will ask ASEAN to support. So we are going to see also display going around of ASEAN providing relief to Myanmar which goes to the refugee of the PDF and not necessarily to the refugee from the military. So this is also something to watch out. Okay, Sakura? So I would like to say that the United Nations and international organizations, so many refugees are there in the Bama. So that refugee, they need Asian, they need international help, international help. The main thing is that they need the food and the immediate please. Please forget about the refugees in my country. Thank you. I think we are not forgetting. The problem is how to ensure that indeed the relief reach uh, those people that most need it. And indeed, in our case, we are interested in those running away from the military, but of course the other one are also human. So it's an all entire issue conflict uh, causes many uh, suffering among all kinds of ordinary, ordinary people. Okay, I think if there are no other uh, comments, I think we have, uh, we will have still two songs, right, from our friend here before I will close the event and then after closing we can have some nice Myanmar food. So please.
After the darkness of our lives, we will reach to the new brighter path. Our faith will set us free. Our lives are not always good, but we must do our best and never give up.
next one is called Dui Tisa. This is the song to encourage the people of Myanmar. Unity is strength and we vow to be loyal to our nation. <laughs> the message is very loud and clear for all of us that are here uh, today. And to finish, let's celebrate our togetherness with some uh, food from Myanmar in the back and we have also tea from Myanmar. <laughs> really sweet tea for those who like it. Please, you can take it in the back. And please give your donation uh, to that allows us to continue this activity. You can also buy postcard of the artwork and the poster of the exhibition in the back. 
So please enjoy, and of course you can still interact with our speaker while you are here. Thank you for coming, and see you to the next event.